life, the easy life when I knew was a young boy and as a young man growing up in these islands is no longer there. They want to live the simple lifestyle, just get up in the morning, have a bath in the sea, go to work in the gardens, and go to fish in the sea, come back, and in the evening socialize, uh, take part in social ceremonies and religious activities. And that is what people love to do. And I think the only people who are actually paid for working on the islands are teachers who work in the local school, the local nurse, and the local priest. Before the 1990s, we could drink from water wells behind our houses or, you know, at the edge of the villages, and the water was fresh. Now we couldn't drink from the water wells because they have become so brackish, they're almost salty. Food is becoming scarce on the islands because there are problems with growing food and the islands now that the soil is becoming more salinated. And, of course, people can't live on just coconuts and fish. They need taro, they need the kakake crops, the swamp taro crops. Now, rice has become the staple because you can't get taro from the gardens anymore. So now people are living more and more on food from the shops. Hunger is becoming an issue. So whereas before you would have, you know, harvest of about three crops, now it's only a harvest of one crop. And even that one crop is not even good quality. It's, it's backward. You would have crops left for about six months to a year before you harvest them. And when you do, the bottoms of the crops would be rotting. Up till the 1990s, not that many children go to school in the islands. But nowadays, more, more and more kids are being sent to school because people are realizing that, you know, as life gets more difficult in the islands, they'll have to send their kids to school so that, in the hope that these children will make it through the educational system and do well and find a job and can make a living. Uh, in the capital, in Honiara and in other urban centres where there are jobs to be found, where people can work. So yes, so life that people used to know, life that they are used to, it's becoming something of the past. My grandmother grew up in the village. It was a thriving, vibrant village then. So uh, I went back in, I went in 2009, actually, the first time I went back to the islands. I couldn't find the cemetery. I found gravestones on the shore. And because I didn't have a guide in, I couldn't find the grave. So I just took pictures of the village. And there were only 11 houses at the time left of a village of about 50, more than 50 houses. So I went back in 2014, just about two years ago. And there were completely, all the houses were completely gone. The original 50 to 11, and now when I went back in 2014, just two houses and the church remaining. All of the houses were washed into the sea. And I had a guy this time who took us, and actually sh sh showed us where the old graveyard used to be. And it was 50 meters out into the sea and more than two feet of water. It was low tide and we went out and, and, and he pointed out the gravestones and actually went and saw the gravestones. I even uh, dived down a bit into the sea and just had a look around with goggles and it's really sad to see those gravestones underwater. I couldn't find where my great-grandmother was buried because it was already, all of the graves were already in the sea. So it was washed away. We've settled there for more than a thousand years now and the prospect of having to move out from this high, the islands and then to settle somewhere else that is strange to us. There's a real danger that, you know, as a people, the Yom Tung Javanese people will, will be absorbed by the greater culture around them. They will lose their identity, living amongst um, people who have a totally different culture from us, who speak a totally different language from us, and who have different cultural practices. Not, not many in the islands are literate. Not many of them have an education, so they have to make do with um, menial jobs that are available. We, we want to be settled in one place, but then we can continue to speak our language in a new place of domicile. Having to 
find land in order to be able to live on this big island, we have to negotiate with the people who are, who are different from us. And there is no guarantee that, you know, if we manage to buy land from them or, you know, by engaging in traditional um, ceremonies in which we buy the land off them, there's no guarantee that, you know, 20, 30, 50 years down the line, these people won't come back and claim their ancestral tribal lands again. And people from other islands who settled around the capital, Honiara, were settling on tribal lands that belonged to a different ethnic group. And then in 1998, the other ethnic group chased all of these people out from their lands, even though they had actually bought these lands from them. So for us, if we have to go to these bigger islands, what guarantee is there that we won't be chased out? People are angry that what is happening to them is caused by, you know, actions of people uh, far away from them and around the world, the other side of the world. Uh, and then there was, an, the people came to accept the fact that, okay, um, climate change is a problem that is here to stay and we have to deal with it, otherwise we can't survive. And so they, um, they went into um, doing things like uh, raising crop, crop beds, trying to put stick walls along some of the coastal areas and even rock stone walls. And for a time it did help us. Um, it was a, a fight that we, we couldn't win. You know, every year the seas just keep rising a few millimeters more than last year and the effects just become more severe than the previous year. So we just keep on, you know, moving up and doing the best that we can. So. So the feeling on the islands is, that, is now is that, okay, we, we'll have to deal with this. And in the immediate future now, ahead of us, is a real prospect of relocation, resettlement out from these islands. And, you know, the last time I was there, I talked to people, all they said was, well, we can't really fight what is coming, um, but we can only do the best that we can to rise above our difficult situation and problems that we face. But we would be really happy and we would be really glad and thankful if those people from developed countries, people from the other side of the world, can, can you know, help to spread the message about the destructive effects of climate change that is affecting us and in a way, you know, be responsible in the way that their lifestyle that they live because what, what they're doing out there is causing all of these problems. So be more responsible in their lifestyle, uh, be more conscious of their energy consumption. That is like getting on board with us and helping us with the little things that we try to do. Whatever people do for them in a small way, they would be grateful for that. <laughs>